If you open your Bibles to Philippians, the first chapter, verses 12 through 14. This is our book. We are in a book study of the book of Philippians. I encourage you to read it every week. It's only four chapters. This is our sixth lesson in the book of Philippians. We're still in chapter one, which is a magnificent chapter on the gospel of Jesus Christ. He mentions it over and over and over and over, and he tells you different things. Every time he mentions a gospel, he tells you something unique about it. And you should pay attention to that. Okay. I try to encourage you to study the Bible. Don't just read it. Study it. Look for markers. When you're reading any book of Paul's, you pay attention to markers. When you read the first chapter, you'll see that the marker is the word gospel. And if you study, once you see that, you, you okay, okay, I'm going to look at that. And every time you see the word gospel, you write down, and he's going to tell you something unique about it every time he mentions it. It's a pretty powerful idea. I'm going to look at one of those today in verses 12, 13, and 14. He's going to tell you one of the things about the gospel if, if you're a person that's interested in the gospel and you're interested in sharing that with somebody else, then you need to know what Paul talks about it in, in Philippians 1 because he's going to tell you unique things about it. Now, when he comes to 12 through 14, he tells you one of the unique things. Watch what he says. He says, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. You see? Now what you're looking for when you study Paul, you go through the first chapter and look and see if he's got markers. He's got them. It's the word gospel. And each time he mentions it, he's going to tell you something different about it. He's going to tell you something that's really important to your life if you believe the gospel is important. Here, he's talked to us that the circumstances that Paul's in, which is prison, He's in prison for preaching the gospel. They put him in prison, prison for preaching the gospel. That my circumstances, my personal circumstances, have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Paul's imprisonment, Paul being locked up, has been a good thing for the gospel. What has the gospel done? Since Paul got locked up in prison, what has the gospel done? Yeah, what, how is it described? Greater progress of the gospel. How about that? Isn't that interesting? And you know what? Not only was it occurring inside the prison system, it was occurring outside the prison system. The progress, the greater progress of the gospel. And Paul's in prison. He is in a cell. And the gospel is going bunkers. Greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, the gospel, the gospel is called, called, called the cause of Christ, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, preaching the gospel, has become, watch this, outside, it's outside the jail, what's happening to the gospel? It's spreading like wildfire, right? Greater progress of the gospel. Now he's going to tell you how, how, where it's spreading to. Has been well known throughout the Praetorian Guard. That's the elite military of the Roman Empire. Of the Roman, the Roman army. That's the elite. That we were, 
in our day, we call that seals or something like that. So where is one of the great greater progresses of the gospel going on? Am among the guard. They, 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 they've assigned the elite to Paul to guard him. And Paul's been converting them. They're going back and getting their buddies. It has the gospel has spread from the guards that are, are are watching him. He's converting them, and they're going back and is spreading the gospel is spreading among the Praetorian guard. And not only that, but watch, and to everyone else, the kitchen staff that was coming down to feed Paul was getting saved and going back, and the entire uh, kitchen staff was getting saved. They were going home, and people were getting saved. Hello, Moody. Hello, Moody. Look. The gospel can have a life of its own if you will give it yours. The gospel will have a life of its own if it, if 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 you will get if you will give your life to it. If you will proclaim it, proclaim it, it will proclaim everywhere it goes. It has now spread to the to the Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So there are a lot of the brethren, the people connected with Paul's ministry, that his imprisonment for the cause of Christ has emboldened them to go out and preach the gospel, and the gospel is being spread among people who had closed themselves up from persecution, the fear of persecution, have now gone out without fear of persecution because of Paul's imprisonment for the cause of Christ. Others picked up the cause. Well, if they're going to put Paul in prison, they're going to put me in prison. Paul's imprisonment has emboldened the, the, young, the young ministers to be bold with the gospel. Isn't that powerful? Ma, ma, ma. And the most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord, I'm going to come back to that word as patho, I'm going to come back, back to that, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Do you know what? The next time he goes into a Roman prison, they're going to kill him. They're going to chop his head off. And do you know what that's going to do to the church of Jesus Christ? It's going to involve them. They're going to preach crazier than they've ever preached. Because they learn how to conquer fear. You face it. You face it and you beat it with the power of God. You never cower to fear. You never give in to fear. You give in to faith, not fear. They're going to, they're going to, in 68, they're going to, they're going to behead Paul. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to go like nuts. Well, we'll shut that preacher up. It just created more of them. Church never, it's, we're not cowards, we're courageous. In the face of adversity, we face it. Because God is greater. 
God is greater, people. God is greater than anything you're facing today, I can tell you. They went out speaking the word without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. I'll talk about that next week. I want you to, I want you to say something. I got three verses, 12, 13, and 14. I broke these three down into three parts, part one, part two, part three, 12, 13, and 14. Now watch this. Write this down in your paper. Did you write that down? Okay, well, you said I wrote it. I know I did. But I want you to get your points right because I got them wrong. All right? I went back and looked at this morning and went, oh. The first part, see the first part on your page? There's only four points under that. That fifth one goes with verse 13. Do you see it says doctrinal points? Look on your paper. You got a paper? Anybody don't have a paper? Everybody's got a study guy? You got a study guy? You need one. Okay. Hey, uh, Don? Uh, Al's got it, Don. Somebody's got it. That, that's right. Bring it down here to this young man. I want you to have a study guide. Either that or you're going to ha ha have to have a pencil. It writes quick. Under part one, watch this. There, what? There's only three parts, but Paul gives nine doctrines. There are nine doctrines you need to know. There are three parts to this, uh, but there are nine doctrines. There are nine doctrines that you need to know. Under, under the first part, which is verse 12, there are four points. In, under verse 13, there are two points. Under verse 14, there are three points. That's nine. Great. That's nine. Make sure you get them because I made one point. Under point one. Now, listen to what Paul says. Here's my, here's my introduction to you. It was Paul's heart desire to share with them about his imprisonment while on the mission field. We have been so fortunate. And the people we've sent out have always been able to come home on schedule. They scheduled out, right, Jackie? You schedule and Rick, you schedule out, you schedule in. Think about Paul scheduling out. Couldn't schedule in because he was in prison. So I'm telling you, you need to pray for logistical grace for these people when they go out. There are a lot of reasons, uh, air flights and all this kind of problems, but there could also be other things. So you need to be much in prayer for logistics. Paul's in prison. What we learn is how the grace gospel was advanced in the world amidst persecution and Paul's imprisonment. Paul is locked up in a cell and the, and the gospel is spreading like crazy out from it. And he never gave in to the idea that he was in prison. See, Paul was always a free man in Christ, right? Galatians 5, 1 and 13. Listen, you're a free person. My father-in-law was a POW three times by the Germans. When he got home, I talked to him about that. He said, I never considered myself a POW. Not one day in my life did I ever consider myself a POW. I'm a free man in Christ. And I depended on God to give me, and he escaped three times from them because he believed that God was greater than the German army. There's a warrior. And there was quite a warrior. And why is Paul in prison? For the cause of Christ. That's undeserved suffering. Put that word in your head because that's what Paul is going to teach you. Paul opened our lesson text with a statement. See, a lot of times we don't hear stuff. We just read it and we don't listen. Listen to what Paul says. I want... You to know, brethren. He's got something that they, he wants to be sure that they know that they don't miss. And he does it really interesting in the Greek language. For example, the word bulamai, the word want. There are different words in the Greek language for the word, English word want. But bulamai, in context here, is a present middle indicative, as that stands for, 
And it means after a lot of thought. I put a lot of thought into this. I put a lot of thought into this. And here's what I want you to know. How can I motivate you? How can I help you understand that the cause of Christ, the cause of Christ in this world, there's nothing greater that you could be a part of than the cause of Christ? You're going, well, I, I, I want to go to college. I want to. I know, I know, I know. But this has nothing to. What you want to do with your life has nothing to do with who owns your life. Is what you should consider. You've been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Your body is the temple of God. You've been bought with a price, the blood of Christ. And wherever you go, wherever you work, wherever you get married, whatever you do, the cause of Christ is why you're there. Paul's in prison. The cause of Christ is the most important reason. It's not, not only the reason they put him in jail, it's the reason he's in jail. When Paul got, they closed the door and locked it, and Paul says, I'm here for the cause of Christ. And he began to preach the gospel. And the gospel spread all over because of it. You wind up going to college. The cause of Christ. You go to high school, it's the cause of Christ. It's always about the cause of Christ. Paul wants us to learn that. I want you to know, Ganasco, present active infinitive. I want you to know this. This is, I've spent a lot of thought in Bulamai. I thought I've spent a lot of time thinking on this to try to get you to understand something. All right? So, Here's my first doctrinal point. Because Paul's talking about as some specific spiritual truth. First doctrinal point. It was Paul's personal desire for them to understand the first part of a specific spiritual truth regarding his present imprisonment for preaching the gospel. And he tells you what it is. It's the cause of Christ, right? I'm in prison because of the cause of Christ. Let me tell you what we call that in theology, and you need to learn this. We call that undeserved suffering. Undeserved suffering. Make sure, make sure you circle that, because that's what Paul wants you to understand. Be sure you circle that undeserved suffering. The second doctrinal point that Paul would want us to know the other part of the specific doctrinal truth of underserved suffering is stated in Philippians 129. Same chapter, a few verses down. It has been granted for Christ's sake, watch this, not only to believe, but also to what? Suffer for whose sake? His sake. There are a lot of reasons to suffer. You know you're in a good cause if you're suffering for Christ, for the cause of Christ. Undeserved suffering. Listen, see the word granted? It's been granted for you, not only, but also. Not only what? To believe, but also to suffer. Not only to believe, but to suffer. You're not going to get out of this world without suffering. You don't want to. Suffering for the cause of Christ. Right? Suffering for the cause of Christ. Oh, man. You'll learn it. Here's a third doctrinal point. This is something also you better pay attention to now. Three categories of suffering in the Christian life. Make sure you understand this. There are three categories of suffering in the Christian life. Undeserved suffering for the cause of Christ, which Paul is in prison. Listen to me. Here's the second one. Don't let this one get you, because this is what gets young people. Self-induced misery. Self-induced misery. It's the consequences of bad choices. Now, I knew I should have, but I didn't listen, and now I'm paying the price for it. I, I know. You know, there's hope after paying the price. 
And God, God will have you back. You still belong to him. Self-induced misery. A good case of that, in my opinion, is Acts, the 20th chapter, 7 through 12, Eutychus, a young teenage boy, second balcony, upstairs, in a window, hot. Paul was preaching all night, all night. He fell asleep and fell out and, and, and killed himself. Fell asleep and fell out, the, fell out of the window and died. And Paul went down and, re, and, and resuscitated him. Took him back upstairs and put him in his seat. And said, kid, have you learned anything? And I'm sitting in the second, second floor in the window and fall asleep. Self-induced misery, consequences of bad choices, and divine discipline. Divine discipline comes as a result of unconfessed sin. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 5, 11, uh, 5 through 11. 1 John 1, 9 would resolve it. And if it doesn't, if you won't confess your sin, then God is going to begin to discipline you. He's going to discipline you because he loves you and he wants to correct bad behavior because you're going to make a mess of your life. The devil's got a fish hook in you and he's pulling you. And he's going to beat you. He's beat, B-E-A-C. Here's my fourth point under verse 12. He declares undeserved suffering is the key. He said that, that's a whole that's a declarative doctrinal principle or truth. That my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. He's put in jail and I said, well, that'll set him up. I told you not to be preaching in straight. I told you not to preach the gospel. I told you that we had all kinds of laws against that. You can't solicit anywhere. You can't on the street. You can't in the buildings. You can't in your house. You can't on the phone. You can't on the... You did it anyhow. So we're going to lock you up and shut you up. And first thing you know, <laughs> out of the prison the gospel goes. And after a while, they couldn't get enough. They, they got the elite army. It spread through the elite army of Rome. It's all over the kitchen staff. <laughs> Ain't God wonderful? I mean, you, can, you shut Paul up. You said shut God up. Uh, you shut Paul up. You shut God up. I'll, I'll shut them. Stick him in prison until he learns better. Well, he learned better. He learned that the gospel will go away from anywhere. You sit on the toilet and it'll spread. I mean, who knows? All right. Now, in verse 13, I got two doctrinal points. That would be fifth and sixth. And here's what's important. Here's, here's what's important. God will promote. Here's my fifth doctrinal point. God will promote his grace ministry and ministry. Get his message and ministry. Watch this now. In ways, places, and people we might not ever imagine. Rick learned that off on his on his probably his second missionary trip. That that second and third missionary trip or thereabout, I've lost count. Has just gone bunkers. Who could have ever imagined? In your wildest dream, you couldn't imagine what's going on. And listen, it hasn't even. It's just on the roll. It's true with Billy Morgan. It's true with all these people out there. It's true with Willie. It's true with Horton. It's true with everybody. He's got to have somebody that's got a voice for Christ. If you'll have a voice for Christ, he will spread it. In ways with people you never imagined. See, that's the part. Listen, God is in control of all that. He's just looking for people to become a voice for him, right? Somebody will stand up and speak on behalf of the Lord and give people the truth. And he'll send that truth as far as it can spread. 
I hope we know that. I hope we know that. An example, Paul's imprisonment of undeserved suffering for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, he says, my imprisonment has become well known, the gospel through my imprisonment has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else. That's a wonderful principle. In verse 13, Paul went on and said, so that, and he uses hoste with an infinitive, and he's going to make a point. He's going to make three points off the aorist, off this infinitive. Hoste, listen, you always pay attention in Greek language. I know you don't, but I do. Hoste, when it's hoste with an infinitive, you look for every infinitive that rolls off from that. And he put three on it. There's three. There's one in 13, and there's two in 14. <laughs> yeah, that's why you come to church here. We're going to give this stuff to you. So that my imprisonment undeserved suffering in the cause of Christ, which is the directive will of God. Was he out doing God's will? Absolutely. We call that your directive will of God. Did Paul know? Listen, Paul knew. Paul knew when, when he was in Troas, when he got the Macedonian call to leave Asia Minor, go across the Aegean Sea to Europe. That was considered Europe. From that to Spain was considered Europe. And he goes to Macedonia of Greece and then down to Archaea. And he is supposed to go west, right? He was told in Troas, don't go east, go west. Because he asked the Lord, shall I go up north? No. Shall I go south? No. Shall I go east? No. Wait a minute. That only leaves west. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Ah, you're good at directions, Paul. That's right. I want you to go west. I want you to go west. Say west, not you. Paul. Paul. Paul's having trouble. Shall I go north? No. Shall I go south? No. East? No. What direction, Paul? West. West, Paul. Say west, Paul. Paul, say west. West. I'm not going north. No. I'm not going south. No. I'm not going east. No. Now, that's really important. This is as important to Paul as it was to Jonah when God told him, hmm? told him to go east, not west. You got to pay attention where God tells you to go. That's my point. Pay attention where God tells you to go. You don't tell God where you're going. Let God tell you where you're going. You'd be better off. All right, so there's the directive will of God, there's a permissive will of God, and there's the overruling will of God. You got to learn this stuff, kids, because it's going to come down the pike. It's going to, these things are going to, look, these are not optional. You got to learn them. What is the directive will of God? Here's the directive will of God for Paul. Paul, I want you to take the gospel, what direction, people? West. Does he want him to go north? No. South? No. East? No. He's already been through that with Paul and Troas. What, what, what direction, Paul? West. Now, we could all get that, couldn't they? I mean, that's pretty simple. I mean, I could even get that. All right, now, the directive will of, is what God reveals to you he wants from you. He wants Paul to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and he wants it to reach the Gentiles all the way to Spain. Romans, the 15th chapter, verse 28. He wants him to go all the way to Spain. He wants to take the gospel all the way to Europe. All right, I'm just telling you the way it is. Just tell it, huh? So the, that's, that's called the director will of God. Listen to me now. Listen to me. There are three categories of the, there, is, there, there are three, there are three um, categories of the will of God that you got to know about, and they always have to line up. There's the geographical will, there's the mental will, and the operational will of God. The directive will of God operates by three very important 
points. You, you got to know this stuff, people. This is, you say, I say to you, do you know where the will of God comes from? You say the word of God. I say, do you know what the will of God is? You go like, well, I don't know. Well, you need to know. There's a directive will, a permissive will, an overruling will of God. The directive will, when God tells you what he wants you to do, it always involves a geographical area, a mental understanding, and an operational activity. You understand that? Well, it's just you've got to know this stuff. If you study any, if you study Jonah, you know it. If you study Paul, you know it. If you study anything about the Bible, you know it. All right? The geographical, for Paul, the geographical is go to Macedonia, go to Archaea, and go west. That was Paul. Paul's mental attitude was must be, I carry the gospel west to Europe. I'm in the Europe theater of evangelism. He knew that he had been called by God to preach to the Gentiles and that Peter had been called to preach to the Jews. He knew that. That was very clear with him. He knew that out of the first church conference of Acts 15. So Paul's got two things that are really important to him. He's got it. He carries the gospel to the Gentiles. God has opened the field of the Gentiles open. And now he knows he's got to go westward in Europe. He, know, he knows it. This is not debatable. This is clear cut. All right? The operation, what does he do? He preaches the gospel and teaches basic doctrines. He, he, convert, he, he confirms the converts. Now, here's the passive, passive will. Oh, geez, I'm out of time. I've ran out of time. Well, anyhow, I can't give you any more today. Shoot or root it. Well, anyhow, for those who come to my study, come on back next week. I'm going to complete this. I'm not going to leave it. Uh, you'll have a chance to study it. Uh, the rest of you have notes. Wow, I didn't realize I ran over. I was keeping up with that time. I just got lost. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The man will take the offering for this service. Is This service has been paid for, but this... Thinking ahead, we take the offering, looking down the pike, and that, that's what this is about. Father, we're so thankful for the Word of God. Oh, we're so thankful. We're thankful, Father, that you're in charge of it in my life. I take it in, but you run it. I mean, that's clear. That's clear with Paul. At least at this point it was. And he proved to Paul, it don't matter where you are, you just stay faithful to the cause of Christ and I'll spread it. And Paul, Paul really saw something marvelous. And he writes about it. But there's a permissive will and there's an overruling will. And God has them for those who think they can run their own ministry their own way. There's no such thing. There's no such thing that's going to come out smelling roses. There's no way. So I pray, Father, as we take this offering, we would pledge for the cause of Christ. We want most of this spent on the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ and a little on ourself. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.